Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Oliver Bozar, and I am a professor of art history at the School of Art at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada. This is the third in a series of three lectures that I'm giving about the great Hungarian artist, Laszlo Mollenai, who was born 125 years ago. In the first lecture, I spoke about Moholy Nadia and Hungarian avant-garde. In the second lecture, I outlined uh, the program that Moholy Nadia developed during, mostly during 1922 and 23 in Berlin, uh, his artistic program, which he kept to pretty well for the rest of his career. In today's lecture, I'm going to speak about um, his uh, theory of new media and the way that, that theory influenced media theory in the 20th century. I think this is one of the most important contributions that he made. And in the process, I will also show you examples of his media art. Okay, and I'm going to share the screen. Okay. So this is uh, Sense in the Future, Moholy Nag Media and the Arts. Let's see if I can take this. So I'm going to start with a quotation uh, um, that Moholy Nag wrote, the text that Moholy Nag wrote in his first book, Painting, Photography, Film. Written in 1924, uh, published in 1925, and then ran to a second edition in 1927. And um, so here it is. The vast development, both of technology and of the big cities, have increased the capacity of our perceptual organs for simultaneous acoustical and optical activity. Everyday life itself accords examples of this. Berliners cross the Potsdam of thoughts. They're talking, they hear simultaneously the horns of the motor cars the bells of the trams, the honking of the buses, the hollering of the coachmen, the roar of the subway, the shout to the newspaper boys, the sounds of a loudspeaker, etc., and can differentiate these acoustical impressions. Whereas a rural person recently found quite disoriented in his plots was so greatly confused by the number of impressions that he stood as though rooted to the spot before an oncoming tram. It is obviously possible to construct an analogous situation with all experience. Analogous also that modern optics and acoustics employed as means of artistic creation can be accepted by and can enrich only those who are receptive to the times in which they live. So this is a statement about uh, the overwhelming nature of contemporary society as it was in the early 1920s, mid 1920s, and this of course is relevant to us today as well. So just as a recap for those of you who haven't heard the previous lectures, Moholy Nagy was born in Bach, showed in southern Hungary in 1895, and uh, died in the in Chicago in 1946. He's considered to be one of the most important progenitors of what is now referred to as media art. But more importantly, he made it his lifetime goal to educate people how to both adapt to and learn from the intensified sensory inputs in there. And this is the key point of today's lecture. This is why he was a fully reformed pedagogy that was, set, that was at the center of Moholy's interests, rather than art making per se. In fact, he saw the art that he produced as aspects, if not byproducts, of his larger pedagogical project, educating people to be able to use their sensory apparatus to its fullest extent, educating people indeed to expand their senses in accordance with the proliferation of media technologies. In Moholy's view, such a sensory education would assist people in successfully adapting to, indeed thriving in our increasingly technologized, mediatized, and image-saturated environment, rather than succumbing to it as the techno-pessimistic anti-modernists of his own time, such as Martin Heidegger held. So um, the futurists have already proposed that artists learn from the simultaneity, as they call it, of modern life that they placed art making rather than pedagogy at the center of their attention. So that's what Mohenoy brought that was new. It was pedagogy. Ever the, 
In an age of even more intensively accelerated technological media change today, modeling Ida's message is all the more important. Ever the optimist, as if anticipating Friedrich Hitler's Heideggerian dictum that it is we who adapt to the machine, the machine does not adapt to us, Mohli Nag attempted to place humanity back in control in light of this disheartening trajectory of change. And this is one of the reasons I said in my preamble that Mohli Nag is still so relevant to us today because he gives us, he presents us with a model as to how artists can help people adapt to the technological and sensory overload of our lives. In achieving this goal, he advocated the use of media without privileging one over the other. This rejection of the media hierarchy legitimized his employment of various media in creative production. He did not wish to privilege new media over old, high art over low art. Rather, he wished to make people aware of the possibilities of all media, new and old, of all culture, high and low, and to exploit their potentialities to the fullest. His experimental and embracing approach to media and materials, his interdisciplinarity, intermediality, his resistance to the hierarchy of visual cultures, his concern with perception and his attitude towards art as information anticipated some of the artistic approaches now current. And those of you who heard my, my last lecture about his, his, uh, his uh, Ars Poetica or his project as laid it out in 1923 in a series of, of publications, will recognize some of these themes. So here, I'm gonna show you some examples now of how he did this in his teaching. Here is a photograph at the upper left of Moholy Nod with six students in the Metalldachstadt, the metal workshop, at the Bauhaus in Weimar, the first location of Bauhaus, around 1924-25, so about a year after he set the position there. And here you have a um, so-called Tastafel, or a tactile chart, uh, from, um, made by the uh, Hungarian uh, Bauhaus student Otti Berger, later on uh, uh, very well known as a textile artist. So this is from Moholy Nagy's introductory course. He taught both the metal, he was both the, um, the artistic advisor to the metal workshop and he taught the preliminary course, which introduced Bauhaus students to the basic principles of design, form, color, composition, and so on, and materials. So here you have this chart by Otzi Berger, which incorporates different materials from textiles to metal meshes, so that you could close your eyes and you could run your fingers over this chart and you'd have a, an artistic experience or a sensory experience. You could also do it with your eyes by looking at it. Later on at the new Bauhaus in Chicago, he instructed his students to make uh, sculptures for the hand, hand sculptures, uh, here are some examples of some students handling these sculptures from a film that they, that Moholy Nag made with his students around 1945-46, and here are more examples of these hand sculptures, or as they were sometimes called, sculptures with wine. So they were sculptures that were meant to be touched. So here he is bringing in the, the sense of, of touch into uh, his, his instruction. His proposal for a mechanical eccentric a sketch for a multimedia display involving colored light, shapes, scents, sounds, and a live dancer anticipates later multi-sensory multimedia productions and the use of projected films on stage. So it's kind of like a vaudeville theater type of thing, but with only a dancer as a live performer, everything else was going to be a kind of spectacle, a multi-sensory spectacle. And there was an entire sense score in this piece which anticipates current efforts to foreground scent as a medium of artistic expression. So in this score, he had um, sound, scent, visuality, and movement as the various elements of this multi-sensory um, um, production which was, which was to be produced on this stage that he has here as a model, model here as well. Later on at the new Bauhaus, his student Charles Niedringhaus actually made a, what he called a smellometer. This is about 1938 for mixing six different odors, six tubes are used, an electric fan blows the smell into the opening of the nose. So you can experience uh, the different scents as a kind of sensory experience. Then there was, of course, vision, very important for Moholy Nag, who was one of the key theorists of the so-called new vision of the 1920s, not photography in Germany. And the new vision was this idea that 
that the um, that the artist, the photographer, should use the, the the camera's technical capabilities to the fullest extent. She shouldn't try to imitate contemporary graphic art or painting the way that the pictorialists did, pictorialist photographers, by having kind of fuzzy, atmospheric images. Rather, the camera should use all its capabilities, sharp focus, the ability to capture motion, uh, the ability to use uh, new media technologies, new sensory media technologies, such as the telescope, the microscope, the X-ray, and also high-speed photography all these uh, techniques to maximize the, the capability, the use of the capabilities, the technical capabilities of the instrument, in this case, the camera, the film camera, the still camera, in order to create a new art, what he called a new vision. And here you see more examples of this. Uh, he recommended also that, that photographers look from above a bird's eye view, like these views from the, uh, this view from the Berlin radio tower, or the view from below, as in some of these photographs, uh, or inverse the tonality of a, of a photograph, or um, focus on textures, which are abject and otherwise would be ignored by artists, such as these footprints in sand, in sand on the beach. All these things he recommended uh, to, to um, uh, the photographers that they used. And he himself employed the same techniques in his films, especially in his, what I call his Metropolitan Trilogy of about 1929 to 32, The Old Port of Marseille, Berlin's Still Lives, and the Metropolitan Gypsies uh, films, which are kind of, uh, do, uh, kind of artsy documentary movies, which in some ways uh, 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 are precursors to the video art as it developed in the 1970s and 80s. And here you can see examples of even, even like, using out of focus images, playing with focus, playing with sharp contrasts of light and dark, and so on. And then he was very interested in the idea of immersion and of participation. In fact, he was one of the um, key pioneers of these concepts, which are so big in today's art world, uh, in the world of contemporary art in the 1920s, including the co-authoring with Alfred Hemming, of the Dynamic Constructive Energy System Manifesto, which I spoke about more in the last lecture, um, and being aware of the various developments, contemporary developments, uh, for example, by his friend, the Dares Raul Hausmann, uh, by his uh, fellow Hungarian activist, Laszlo, or later Peter Peri, uh, and his, his, his ideas for an immersive and participatory theater called Frey, and so on. So, all, in all these ways, Mahoney Nod uh, was a precursor to immersive and participatory approaches to artistic production. And this, the, kinetic, the proposal for a kinetic constructive system structured with movement track to play and conveyance in the 1922 version, here in the 1928 version, drawn by the Hungarian architect, Stan Sheber, proposed a kind of multi-story play structure for adults where people could experience their kinesthetic, the proprioceptive senses, or inner bodily senses, uh, in a way that, that I think that no other uh, art, <coughs> excuse me, artist at the time <coughs> had suggested. As he wrote in his, <coughs> in his, uh, in his manifesto, Production Reproduction, which was published in the style in 1922, and which, with, for which he, um, the ideas for which he, he discussed very, very uh, uh, deeply with his uh, first wife, Lucia Moholy, man is the synthesis of all his functional apparatus. That is, at his various stages, he will be most perfect when he is most fully conscious of the functional apparatuses, cells, just as much as the most complex of organs, of which he's comprised, and when these apparatuses are trained to the limits of their capability. So he's, he's telling people to know your body, know your sensory capabilities, know your organs, know your own biology. Once you know about your own body, then you're ready to perceive the outside world in new ways. And here is a model, a digital model, of the kinetic, uh, uh, of this artwork 
um, which, uh, which Mahoney Nagy uh, uh, proposed, modeled by Peter Yaden, an architect at the Rhode Island School of Design. In his writing about cinematic projection spaces, Mohly Knight was critical of thinking that did not take fully take into account of the media, fully take account of the medium's technical possibilities. He thought in completely new ways about both the configuration films could take, given the possibilities of projection, and about the ensuing narrative implications. Though in general, he avoided narrative in his work. He speculated in his book, Painting Photography Film, which you can see in the slide on these new possible configurations. And this is a quotation from that book in a proposal for what he called a poly cinema. And here is the, the basic scheme for the poly cinema showing multiple tracking film projections in a uh, convex space. I know it's a little bit hard to read, but each of these arrows indicates one projector, which can also track in different directions. And so you create this very dynamic a filmic environment. So this is his own, in his own words, one should, one should construct a cinema with a concave projection screen in place of today's flat rectangular variety. This concave surface must have a very large radius. That is, it should be shallow and should be positioned towards the audience at a 45 degree angle. Several films would be projected onto this projection surface. And in fact, not projected onto one spot, but rather tracking continually from left to right, right to left, down to up, up to down, and so on. Using this procedure, one or more initially autonomous, autonomous events meeting at predetermined points of intersection when it makes sense for them to do so could take place. And as far as I know, this is the first uh, proposal by a, um, a contemporary artist in the 20th century for a, uh, an environment, an artistic environment, which was not only a multi-projection environment, there were a couple of other proposals from around the same time that did just that, but rather a dynamic multi-projection environment where the audience is surrounded by these multiple projections and where the projections themselves are moving because the, the, um, the, either the projectors are, are tracking or the projectors use a mirrors, mirroring system to track for them, like to move from side to side for them. So this is a really, really um, uh, radical uh, proposal on Mahoney's part. And this is what came to be known as expanded cinema in the 1960s and onwards. And I actually collaborated with some colleagues of mine at the University of Manitoba in the Faculty of Architecture, Lancelot Core, Professors Lancelot Core and Patrick Harrop, and uh, along with some other uh, graduate students, including Chris Burke, um, for this poly cinema, oops, let's go back here. I'll move this out of the way. Um, where they constructed, Lancelot Corps constructed a, uh, a kind of oblong projection space using scrim, uh, so it's concave the way that Mahone and I wanted it, wide angle, and within that we placed. Uh, a, uh, a light projection device, um, a kinetic light projection device that Patrick Hare constructed, and also the uh, reconstruction of Mahoney Nagy's own light prop from electric stage. This is shown at the Bauhaus Archive in Berlin. And then Chris Burke and I de developed a, um, a, uh, um, a script for various scenes from those three films which I mentioned to you earlier in this lecture to be tracked within this projection space, and they would come together at various moments of convergence. So here you have uh, one image of this, the way that these, these film uh, uh, images, projected film images would distort, but distort in the most beautiful ways and would converge in interesting ways as well. Mahoney Nagy himself was never able to realize this project. We were able to realize it in one way. It's not a work by Mahoney not obviously it was suggested by him, and it really turned out to be something very, very interesting. And in this shot, you can see one of the projectors up here um, that could pivot in a, in a, uh, in a, um, a device produced by uh, uh, Patrick. 
electric therapy. And another image, including the light talking electric stage, showing the, the, uh, the projection. But Moholy-Noyd was not only a pioneer of new media goals and possibilities, he was also one of the first artists to face the limitations of his ideas. Let me read you a text by him penned in the mid-1930s. Dear Kelly Buddha, you are surprised that I'm again arranging a growing number of exhibitions. It is true that for a number of years I ceased to exhibit or even paint. I felt it was senseless to employ means that I could only regard as out of date and insufficient for the new requirements of art at a time when new technical media were still waiting to be explored. So begins the central text of Telehor, a journal launched in 1936 in Brno, Czechoslovakia, by the young Moravian architect and film enthusiast, František Kalibuda. Reading it today, one cannot help but think that the words do not seem to reflect the political and artistic reality of the 1930s Europe, a time of, significant, of a significant move to the right of a seemingly inexorable slide towards fascism. In its evocation of new tech technical media, it would seem to refer to an age when new media art was on the agenda of aesthetic debates. It is a prescient, pioneering statement of the tensions between, between the traditional and new media and art, tensions that would come to characterize artistic debates of the second half of the century. And he continues in this rhetorical letter to Kelly Buddha uh, in the following way. You have every right to ask why I surrendered arms, why I am again painting and exhibiting pictures after once having recognized the real task confronting the painting of today. This question demands a reply. Quite apart from any personal considerations, for it is a vital concern for the rising generation of painters, youth, and I think he's meaning here the 23-year-old Kelly Buddha and his generation, has every right to know why our demands have failed, why our promises have remained unfulfilled, at the same time, youth has the duty to continue to the, to the search for new forms to carry forward the demands of art. So this text refers to what I consider as the first crisis of media art in the modern age. In the 1920s, starting in 1922, as we saw in the last lecture, Mohling Nagy made all kinds of proposals. He experimented with various media and, and, and even more uh, proposals, one more uh, kind of unrealizable, if you like, than the next although he didn't think of them as that in that way at all. And then in the 1930s, and even for a time, Mahoney Nagy stops to paint around 1928 when he returns from the Bauhaus to Berlin to set up his freelance business. He stops painting for a while, but then he goes back to it. And this is what Frankishek Kalibuda was asking him, he was, he was replying to in his letter, his rhetorical letter. Why is it that it seems like he's retrenched his principles, but in fact he hadn't, he was just waiting for the right time to realize these plans. So what trace, traces, if any, did Moholy Nagy's writings and ideas leave on the 20th century arts? Although the influence of Moholy Nagy's media theory is now widely recognized, even a perusal of literature on key 20th century media theorists yields intriguing clues as to his importance. A still small but increasing number of historians now acknowledges that Moholy Nagy occupies a position of importance among early 20th century artists as it concerns the development of what it is often referred to as art in the media. So I really want to emphasize here that, that Moholy Nagy is not only recognized as uh, an important progenitor or pioneer of new media art as it developed in the second half of the 20th century, unfortunately after he had died of leukemia early in 1947, but he's also recognized now as one of the most important media theorists of the early 20th century, even though he wasn't really a systematic thinker or a systematic writer. He kind of threw ideas out there um, and, uh, and wrote them down, often edited very closely by his first wife, uh, Lucia Maholi, uh, and, and his close collaborator, Lucia Maholi. Anyway, here are, but he's also recognized now, as I mentioned, as an important media theorist. So here are the media theorists of the 20th century who demonstrably learned from the whole night. And this is a pretty stellar list. Walter Benjamin, uh, the German-Jewish uh, media theorist and critic. Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian media theorist, often seen as the most important media theorist of the second half of the 20th century, mid-20th century. Siegfried Gideon, 
Mohoinaga's very close friend, uh, the Swiss uh, art historian who's also considered to be an important media theorist, Jared Kepesh, Mohoinaga's mentee and collaborator, again, uh, seen as an important, uh, not only as a media theorist, but as a practitioner of new media art. John Cage, one of the most important artists of the mid 20th century, actually a composer who influenced uh, media and new media artists enormously. And Wilhelm Pusser, the Czech Jewish um, uh, media theorist who became so important in the late 20th century. The close relationship between Siegfried Gideon, who is very well known to uh, uh, architecture theorists and students as the author of Space, Time, and Architecture. This is a particularly salient instance of Moholy impact on 20th century media theory. Gideon is, na is uh, now as famous for his authorship of a book, Crucial Contemporary Architectural Thinking, Space, Time, and Architecture, as I mentioned, as he is for his book, Mechanization Takes Command. Before he wrote the introduction to Telehor, Gideon had cooperated with Moholy Naga on a number of projects, the most intensive being the outline for Gideon's first major book, Bauen in Frankreich, Eisen, Eisenbeton uh, of 1928, Construction in, in France, um, um, Concrete and Steel. Olivier Lugon argues that Gideon, Gideon's genealogical approach to art history, which did not separate past, present, and future, decisively shaped Moholy Naga's thinking. So Olivier Legon uh, specifies the way in which Gideon's approach to art history, which was atemporal, influenced Moholy Nag. Gideon in turn adopted Moholy Nag's idea of a new optics, as well as his notion of the gazamte, the complete work. Moholy Nag's notions on the reproducibility of images inspired Walter Benjamin's seminal 1936 essay art in the age of its mechanical reproducibility. Philosopher, philosopher Gerd Markusch highlights this point, quote, for the German discussion on reproduction, the appearance of the book by Laszlo Mahoyanagy in 1925 had a decisive uh, uh, significance. Painting, photography, film served as a reference point for the ensuing discussion, end quote. Particularly Mahoyanagy's prediction of the rise of the domestic pinacoteca or the, uh, the home library of images private collections of art reproductions, as Christina Toshut was the first to point out. Again, following in Toshut's footsteps, Herbert Moldering's cites Mohoinaga's, quote, constructive photographic aesthetic as the, quote, theoret theoretical foundation of Benjamin's highly influential short history of photography. In his piece on Mohoinaga's media theory and its effects, Philippe Shimai notes that Mohoinaga recognized the way that the apparatus makes or determines cultural epochs and therefore new regimes of experience. And by the apparatus, he means the technical uh, apparatus. Before Benjamin, before the Winnipeg media theorist Marshall McCoy, and before Villain Pusser. So this is quite uh, the strong argument for Mohoi uh, um, uh, influence on the key media theorist of the early 20th century, uh, Walter Benjamin. In 1919, Rainer Maria Rilke proposed the idea that media are the extensions of the human body. It was Mohlinaga's articulation of this notion of media as extensions of our sense organs that was adopted by Marshall McLuhan. Even though he never met Mohlinaga, McLuhan read and was apparently teaching with Mohlinaga's book, The New Vision, soon after its second English language edition appeared in 1938. And he wrote a review of Mohlinaga's final posthumous book, Vision and Motion, in combination with Mechanization Takes Command in 1948 for the Hudson Review. Richard Cavell, the Canadian uh, uh, media historian, goes as far as to say that Moholy Nugget's work, quote, played a crucial role in McLuhan's aesthetic. This is a pretty strong statement, unquote. And this view is certainly underpinned by McLuhan's choice of an image from Vision and Motion, this image here, as the frontispiece for the 1956 Verbo visu, Voco Visual Edition of the journal he edited in Toronto, Explorations, with Edmund Carpenter. So here is the cover page of, of uh, Explorations, the Verbi Voco Visual, that is inter, uh, intermedial uh, issue of this Toronto journal, using an image of a face with an eye um, 
with an ear superimposed onto the eye, taken from Mahoy Nagy's book, Vision and Motion. Yared Kekash, founder of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Center for Advanced Visual Studies, and a key instigator of post-war media art, had been Moholy Nagy's mentee and studio assistant in Berlin and London, and a faculty member under his leadership at Moholy Nagy's Institute of Design in Chicago. It can be argued that he carried on Moholy Nagy's project in some ways after Moholy Nagy's death in 1946. And this is controversial among uh, Kefesh scholars. Uh, some see it as a kind of denigration of Kefesh's uh, original, uh, undoubtedly original uh, contribution to 20th century pedagogy, art, media theory, new media art, and so on. I don't see it that way at all. I see Kefesh's impulse and inspiration as partly coming from Moholinod. There were others as well, as has been pointed out by my Hungarian colleague, Mahatma Oros, for example. Um, but I think that in many ways, Kefesh self-consciously even wanted to carry on uh, Moholinod's media theory. Brandon Joseph reports John Cage's assertion that the new vision was, quote, extremely influential to John Cage's thinking from the 1930s onwards, and that reading it was what attracted him to teach at Mohoi Nagy's Institute of Design in 1941, a fact that many people don't know. John Cage taught at Mohoi Nagy's school. Mohoi Nagy invited him to do so. Aspects of Mohoi Nagy's thinking on media have reverberated through the work of key post-war media theorists, um, other uh, key theorists such as uh, Hitler, Fusser, Deleuze, and Baudrillard as well. In her 2016 book, Art as Organism, Carissa Terranova argues that Molinard and Benjamin developed the idea of photography exposing a kind of optical unconscious, as Benjamin put it. This was the details and distortions of the world, not normally visible that one can study in a photograph, the captures a slice of the world. She points out that building on Alois Regal's work on the late Roman art industry, quote, Benjamin set in relief how history in the form of new technology produces new subjects and more importantly, new cognitive possibilities. She goes on, I use the term haptic unconscious to describe a means to art, science, and technology that begins with Mahoyanai and is traceable throughout the 20th century. Extent in the practices of Kyrie Kepesh, Kevin Lynch, Rudolf Arnheim, Ernst Gombrich, a bevy of off new, te new tendencies and grab artists, the artists of EAT and Jack Burnham, among others, end quote. And that list includes a lot of the most important mid to late uh, 20th century uh, new media workshops, uh, uh, festivals, and theorists. The very listing of these names within a context of the discussion of Moholy Nagy's works serves to, in an imaginary sense, thrust a mental bridge from the mid-1930s crisis concerning new and traditional media that Moholy Nagy gave voice to in the text of Telahor, and the very heart of late 20th century and early 21st century media theory and criticism. The potential for such a span across the decades and is yet largely unexplored bundle of links is what makes the investigation of Molinaga's unsystematic but incisive thinking on artistic practices and attitudes of the post-World War II era and the prescience of some of his ideas, one gains an idea of his importance. Mapping Molinaga's achievements onto the matrix of 20th century art, media, art, cinema, alternative education, and media theory is a task that still needs more thorough attention. So I began this presentation by citing Mohoi Nagy's own exa example of the potentially overwhelming nature of sensorial inputs of, in modernity. And remember, he cited this example that he read in a newspaper in Berlin in the mid-1920s of this country bumpkin coming to the Potsdamer Platz in Berlin, the busiest corner uh, traffic-wise in Europe at that time, and also the site of the first traffic light actually anywhere the first um, autom automated traffic light. And uh, this, this country bumpkin is just mesmerized by all these sensory inputs, both visual and oral, sound and sight, and is kind of like a deer in the headlights. He's like, uh, 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 he's stopped in front of an oncoming streetcar. 
So Molinar's purpose in writing this is to point out that it is artists by adopting the latest technological devices available to them from the sciences, from new technologies. By adopting these technologies and using them in order to make art, he could, artists could there, thereby humanize these new technologies and help people to live happier, more constructive lives within the over-mediatized and over-technologized over, uh, 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 environment of modernity. So in calling for sensory training, in helping people to adapt to the pace of technical change in modernity as a task for artists, and thereby in opening up the range of senses and media that artists have to work with, Moholy Nod sensed aspects of the future course of artistic and medial development. Looking back to see what he had to say about this condition of modernity and artistic pedagogical responses to it may help us in dealing with our own hyper-stimulating technological and sensory environment. And this, I think, is the most important um, gift that Mohonad gave us. And this is why he is so important. And this is to us today, and this is why his importance continues to increase as this intensity of technologization of our world continues to increase as well. And I conclude here with images of the English and German editions of my exhibition and book project, Sense in the Future, Moholinard Media and Arts. This was an exhibition produced at Plugin Institute of Contemporary Art in Winnipeg in 2014 and at the Bauhaus Archive, uh, the Museum for Design in Berlin in 2014-2015. Um, and uh, this is where I explored some of these ideas. So if you're interested in following up on these ideas, you're welcome to uh, look at either of the two editions of this book. Thank you so much for your attention uh, in these three lectures. Thank you to the Hungarian Cultural Center in New York and the Balashi Institute for inviting me to give these lectures. And I wish you all um, a safe and, um, and uh, a productive time uh, during these unprecedented this unprecedented period. Thank you so much.